morning, everybody. Welcome to Instrumental Breakthroughs. Uh, happy Monday. I'm your host, Daniel Shankin. I'm the program director of the show and of TAM Integration. We offer psychedelic integration circles, coaching, and education all over the world. Uh, I would certainly like to thank our co-producers, uh, Livestream Remote, and Steve, and also Deadheadland, and Brian. Brian, thanks so much for hosting us. I would also, I'm very, very excited, and very happy and pleased to have our guest today, who is actually celebrating his 50th year in music, songwriting, and performance, yeah. um, and, and so many other things. I don't even have to introduce you. You need no introduction. Introduction, David. David Gans. Thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So the idea of the show is we talk to uh, rock and roll superheroes. That's you. Okay. And... <laughs> <laughs> Not my self image, but I'll take it. Just uh, you know, own it for a moment for the next hour. <laughs> just own it. And so every we know that every good superhero has a powerful origin story. Hmm. And so what we're really curious about, perhaps, is a psychedelic origin story, a way that, you know, plant medicine, sacred science, chemistry, perhaps gave you a few aha moments that turned you into the magnificent being that we are beholding with great eyes of love today. You know, I don't think I can really attribute much of this stuff to psychedelics because I was really a total wimp about psychedelics a lot of the time. When I was, mm -hmm. I, 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 a few years ago, I found these um, journals that I had kept in little spiral notebooks when I was a teenager. I was a pretty unhappy kid, but I noticed that I, I took a lot of, of acid when I was like 13, 14, 15, and more often than I recall doing. And of course, it's hard to say whether it was actually acid. I do remember spending five bucks on a saccharin tablet once. Um, but, um, you know, I, I remember getting a lot of headaches and I remember having a lot of anxiety and stuff. And so I, I, I don't think I really got what I needed out of psychedelics in the first few years I was taking them. But I did have uh, that monumental experience on, I believe it was Christmas Eve of 1970, which means I was uh 17 years old mm -hmm. and my my older brother my my, my brother uh, roger who's two years older than me uh launched me into a lot of things in my life he was it was his guitar that i wrote my first song on in collaboration with him he was two years older and uh, um had been through a lot of adventures and and he and my best friend and and a musical partner craig and craig's hippie uncle uh, Dave took me on a trip Christmas Eve and I, I think it was mescaline I can't remember but I'm pretty sure and, and I found out later that they all kind of cheek their doses and didn't get high so they could just be my trip master and take me on this journey so but they did that out of love presumably not not not, not to mess with you they wanted no, to no, no. create something nice for you yeah, I, I, and I don't know whether this was intentional. I, I've never really interrogated my brother about it. I should ask him about it now. Um, but it basically wound up being that sort of, you know, revelatory night that you need where people will sort of teach you stuff. Un Uncle Dave was a Buddhist and, and, a, um, uh, and a, uh, like a... a uh, alternative theater guy and stuff like that so he was sort of like the hippie ideal older dude to sort of come on take us along on this and it and i got a lot of lessons in sort of buddhist stuff you know the thing about before enlightenment chop wood carry water after enlightenment mm -hmm. chop wood carry water. all that stuff that sort of seems like cliches now was brand new to me when i was 17 years old and right. we we had this long night and they were like talking to me and teaching me stuff very little of which i re can remember in any kind of detail but then in the morning at dawn we went out in the car and, and drove out into the country and just took a look at the newness of everything it was quite a wonderful thing and that i think that was kind of like i i can't say that it changed i mean i think it planted a lot of seeds but i was way too fucked up a kid to really sort of start taking advantage of it for many years i i had to overcome what uh, a therapist called uh, low-grade emotional abuse for an, my entire young life i had to get out of a family that was kind of atomized and and not 
particularly um, kind to each other. It was a very competitive and emotionally um, kind of uh, uh, agitated family, right? So I needed to escape a lot of that kind of stuff before I could really get my spiritual life together. So I think the spiritual stuff kind of came along by osmosis from spending years and years around the Grateful Dead and among Grateful Dead people and with people that were mighty trippers who didn't have long times of anxiety and stuff like that. And I stopped taking acid altogether for many years because I realized it wasn't really doing me any good. I wasn't enjoying the trip. I was anxious and, and uncertain. So I wasn't getting anything out of it. So I quit doing it for a long time, during which I got my shit together. I, I got my heart broken really bad in 1990. And the woman left a book in my house called The Drama of the Gifted Child. By okay. Miller. And it literally changed my life. That book, I read that book and I thought, you know, I'm really tired of being unhappy. And I'm tired of not having satisfying relationships. And maybe I should do something about it. And that book got me to see a therapist. And I spent a couple of years seeing a therapist every week and walking out of there every week with new information that I could use. I mean, I went in there ready to work. Right. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, this was not aided with psychedelics. This was just a regular old talk therapy thing. But I came out of that process a much more integrated person and much more able to handle everything. And I started tripping again. And okay. now when I dose, it's just nothing but total joy. You know, I had to get, I had to sort of un clear out a lot of spider webs and shit in the back of my head and get rid of a lot of bad information about how to deal with people. And that's what that therapy thing was. I remember a specific day when I learned, I broke the habit of responding to hurtful stuff with hurtful stuff. And I remember because I left that day going, oh, okay, I've been escalating instead of resolving all my life doing this. And I had a moment, an opportunity almost immediately afterwards to put this into practice where somebody said something that hurt me. And I turned around and said, hey, that hurt. Instead of attacking back, I said, hey, that, you know, that hurt, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was literally a life-changing moment. And that sort of stuff put me into a position where I can actually kind of feel like a solid person and enjoy life. So now it's a matter of finding time to take a dose. Right. Because you, know, you really want to do it right, you need a, a, a full day and stuff like that. So generally I manage to take a dose when we get to Hawaii, which has been about every third year in the last few years. And, and um, But I don't do it casually. I want, If I'm going to do it, I want it to be a, an opportunity to go somewhere and do something. I, I mean, internally, not driving around the country. I mean, I want to, I want to, I've always felt like it was a tool, not a, a toy. That when I take a psychedelic trip, I want to accomplish something spiritually or creatively with it, not just party. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm dominating the rap, so I'm going to stop talking now. Well, you're doing good. Well, I really appreciate that you are getting into the idea of personal work being important right oh, hell yeah. and you know it's that i do sometimes see people kind of show up and there's more and more in the news about how psychedelics are able to get into things like anxiety and depression and ptsd and people seem to want a silver bullet Right. And well, I, it's, I have, a therapist told me that back in that process, I have a dear friend who's a therapist. And when I was talking about how pleased I was with the work that my therapist had done with me, she said, you know, a lot of people walk in expecting you to like open a panel on their back and flip a switch and fix them. And it doesn't work. And when I thank my therapist for his amazing work, he said, hey, I just held up the mirror. You came in ready to do this. Right. But, so I know what you're saying. People come in and expect you can just fix them or that the drugs will fix them, but they don't do that. They just sort of loosen things up so you can tighten the bolts where they need to be tightened and, and uh, rewire things where they need to be rewired. Or hold up several mirrors so that yeah. everywhere you turn, that's where it's like, oh, here's eight hours of unescapable mirrors. I, I needed to do it and it all paid off for me because shortly after I, I stopped seeing that therapist regularly, I met the woman who became my wife and I need to 
do all that work in order to be able to participate in a real human relationship, you know? And I, I did it. And we, we have seen a counselor fairly regularly throughout the course of our marriage to develop the tools. And we have really, really good tools. And we do not have fights because we're really, really good at resolving conflicts. And we have this tremendous, deep, you know, love for each other that um, drives everything and keeps us uh, engaged with each other. I'm turning off yeah. a browser so that I can not have that thing beep while we're talking. Okay. Right. That might actually have been me beeping. Because oh. um, that's interesting because we're still doing the work. We, we You've been married 25. forever. 25, yeah. Okay. We've been married um, about a tenth of that. Mm -hmm. And we're not great at resolving conflict just yet. Um, and we do do the work, right? You know, it's like we, you know, I see a therapist and I... We go to, do you know Newt Bailey by any chance? I don't. San Francisco guy teaches nonviolent communication. Oh, and that's some really interesting stuff. To kind of learn that languaging has been really, really quite, quite good. Um, and I'm, I'm trying what to think, what else to think about that while still... Yeah, but it, it's, it's certainly a challenge. It's certainly a challenge and it's really interesting what comes up when you are in fact sort of quarantined with each other. Well, that's, yeah. And in fact, here's something interesting. Our, uh, ne our next door neighbors, a young couple moved into an apartment next door to our house about a week before the lockdown started. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the neighborhood. Hi, nice to meet you. How are you? What do you do? And it turns out they are a brand new relationship. They just moved mm -hmm. the first time and we thought, holy shit. What a time to get locked down together in a, right. in a like what happened? What if this, you know, what if their if their love doesn't take? What if they find themselves trapped in this place in an unhappy relationship? So far, they seem to be doing fine, but it was like, it was it was like, oh my god, what a terrible time to to put put your sanity at risk, you know, like this. Right. Well, but you never know the future. You don't know, you know, how can you know that kind of thing is going to happen? And well, it's well, also just really interesting, you know, the, the idea when we're talking about, you know, holding the mirror up, you know, relationship as mirror is a really interesting thing as well. Is, you know, it's one thing to have a relationship that's just sort of sexy and fun. It's another that's sexy and fun and also makes you grow. Well, that, that's, I, I also read The Road Less Traveled around the time that I read, um, uh, uh, the Drama of the Gifted Child. Do you know that book, M. Scott Peck? You know, I'm, I've seen the cover. I haven't gotten into it. it I, I'm guessing I am guessing I should probably read it. it. It would probably be worthwhile. And it's the kind of book that you could give to somebody who says, oh, therapy, you know, that's what I'm going to do. You know, it's like you can, it, it, it introduces you to the concept of things like passive dependency and how, how you don't want to be in a relationship with things like that. So the two books were what drove me into therapy. But I, I was highly motivated and you have, I wanted to become a happy person. I wanted to be able to have relationships. I once had a guy quit a band that I was in and urge everybody else in the band that they should quit too, because I was such an impossible guy to work with. And the funny thing is now I want to go back and, and, and apologize to that guy for having been impossible to work with because I was in those days and I needed to do a lot of work on myself to make myself a better person. Here's another example, especially useful to you in a, in a younger marriage. I had to learn step-by-step step to stop allowing my emotions to rule me. When you, when something happens to you, you know, your f first reaction might be to respond in kind, like, you know, the whole fucking Donald Trump bullshit hit back 10 times harder, you know, that the, the utterly inhuman, impossible, worst possible way to interact with people that our president embodies. Mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. I had to learn to recognize a strong emotion when it was approaching and grab it and control it instead of letting it control me. And I have, over the years of this marriage and all the work we've done together, I've gotten to a point where if something happens that pisses me off, I can stop and address it calmly rather than reacting angrily. 
And so I can just stop and say to my wife, hey, you know, you realize what you just said was this, this, you know, instead of like, oh, fuck you, blah, 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 blah. You know, you don't escalate. Right. You negotiate. And having acquired those skills, I am, I, I just, I'm no longer dominated by my emotions. So we've strayed away from psychedelics here, but it all connects to, you know, integrated souls, right? I didn't right. need psychedelics specifically to, as a tool to, um, affect these changes in myself, but affecting these changes in myself allowed me to have a much healthier relationship with psychedelics. And I enjoy my psychedelics tremendously now because right. they don't take me through this, you know, uh, horror show, uh, uh, um, haunted house ride, you know? Right. So I am curious, how has your music changed as a result of this? from this time when you were the emo this emotional reactive guy to the guy who's calm and smooth and I'm a much better bandmate. Okay. I, I, the, the thing you mentioned earlier about the, uh, I, this was before we went on air, I guess, talking about the, 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 the uh, joy of performers that we see, right. the people who exhibit that joy. I, I have become one of those people. I, I have also had people recount stories to me of behavior I did on stage. You know, I was uptight. Even when I was the band leader, I wasn't a particularly decent leader. I was, I, I was passive aggressive and, and uh, controlling and all these other things that, that emanated from my insecurities. And now I'm a much more confident leader. I've produced records and I've gotten compliments from people about my, you know, managing uh, my ability to manage these things. I, I, I just became somebody who's happier in his own skin, and that makes me much easier to get along with, and and um, a much more effective band leader, and also a much more effective band player. I I think I'm somebody who can very happily serve in a subservient role as a sideman in somebody else's band without feeling any need to challenge the leadership of that person. I crave opportunities to be an accompanist, to play that subservient role, because as a primarily solo performer, I'm all alone up here most of the time. So when I get into a chance to, an opportunity to play with other people, it's really, really great to retreat into equality and, and become one with those other people rather than try to control them or run the show. You know, as Phil Lesh said in his, in his autobiography, uh, after reading this book called More Than Human, the Grateful Dead wanted to become a human gestalt. They wanted to all be the fingers on a hand, one merged musical soul playing as one unit, right? Mm -hmm. That's the coolest possible thing when you're making music with other people is when you forget yourself and you belong to this bigger thing. And when the Grateful Dead was happening, and when my band is happening, that's what happens. You kind of forget who you are and surrender to that flow state. And that is much easier to attain when you're a happier integrated person and you're not constantly trying to keep tabs on other people and run other people and um, steal the show, as it were. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating what will pull you out of the flow, you know, and, and, and the, the hooks that, you know, the sort of sore spots that can just almost bring themselves up to be healed. It's almost like the flow state on one level has a healing presence. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, you know, here's, here's another thing you can deal with. Here's another thing you can deal with. So who are some of your favorite people to accompany? Oh, God. Well, I, I produced a record for a fellow named Joe Burke, who's a, okay. a singer-songwriter here in the Bay Area. And uh, I had so much fun doing his songs with him that we started a band. All the guys that he plays with are wonderful musicians. And, you know, we brought a, a really cool band together to, to uh, record the songs. And we had so much fun doing it that we decided to become a band and start playing out. We play a bunch of my songs. We play all of Joe's songs. We play a bunch of covers and stuff. It's just a really fun kind of bar band thing. Mm -hmm. It was just starting to pick up a little steam um, when the lockdown hit. So now I'm just doing daily streams from home and, and not getting to play with a band at all. Um, I... I, I can't, I don't get that many opportunities to do it. When I, when I'm on tour, I play with other bands and I'm a guest musician 
in a, I sit in with dead tribute bands around the country, you know, and I get to see lots of different approaches. That whole thing, that's also on that continuum between sort of rigid recitations of Grateful Dead songs as they did them and strongly interpretive stuff where you take it someplace else. I favor the mutating interpretive scale end of the scale rather than the authentic copy band kind of end of the scale. But I get to play in all these different contexts and the, the challenge and the reward for me is to get to play, is to do what's appropriate in each of those situations. It, it's, I don't get up there and go, hi, I'm David Gans, look at me. It's more like I get to play with you. Let's do something together, you know? And if you direct attention away from yourself, it comes back to you anyway, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it, the less you obsess with getting attention, the, the more likely you are to attract attention by doing something solid and good. Um, there's a, there, I would love to do this thing, and I get to do it very occasionally, like go uh, uh, go to a club where a bunch of people are playing, and you just kind of get to sit and play along with songwriters, you know, like a company. And there's a wonderful woman here in Northern California named Nina Gerber, who's sort of the go-to player for that. All these wonderful singer, songwriters, and bluegrass people around here. She she came up as one, uh, one of Kate Wolf's uh, band uh, players, you know, and she's just sort of, the, the accompanist, and she's so sensitive and so wonderful, and she could sit with a total stranger and just play their songs with them and enhance those songs. And I love to be that kind of person. Like at a party or something, I love to sit with other musicians and just under underscore what they're doing, sing harmonies, play a little bit of lead here and there, just to help somebody else deliver their thing, you know? It's, it's as much as I get to, to stand up and be myself and be the center of attention as a solo performer, I really crave the opportunity to, to um, support, to be a support player. Right. I think what you're really talking about is like the power of presence. You know, it's like how present can you be and how attentive and how appropriate. You know, it's like what does, it's almost like what they say in Aikido, like how do you have the maximum effect with the minimum effort? Sort of thing. How, do, how do you nudge something in just the right way to just create increasing amounts of beauty? It's they, the Henry Kaiser taught me one very, very simple three word phrase that has served me tremendously well over the years. Serve the music. Mm. And, and again, when I was younger, you know, the guy that the guy that that uh, drove people out of his band and stuff was I was much more much less sensitive to to the gestalt energy and much less able to subsume myself into the group and now that's what i crave and that's what i wish for and i find it frustrating when i get with musicians who don't understand that and the best thing of all is when you get to play with really great musicians who crave the same kind of mutuality and mutuality and forgetting yourself and all that stuff that's the spiritual aspect of music making that I now have access to, that I sought for so long before I went and did the work to become a, a happier person. You know, it, it all, my, the, the journey of myself was necessary to the journey of me as a musician, because I don't think I was as effective a musician until I made myself a more effective human being. Can you pinpoint a moment of growth where like something shifted that enables you to now serve the music more, like some sort of, if not a psychedelic aha, a therapy aha. You're like, oh, okay, that's. Well, I, I, I can't, I, I mentioned the one about learning not to re react, you need right. to respond in kind to an insult, right? Yeah. I, there were, I think there were a hundred of those. I literally, yeah. I walked out of that therapy session every week with new tools. I, I can't, I don't think I can point to a specific moment because I think I was on that quest for my entire life. I, I didn't, I didn't want to be this unhappy, sarcastic little fuck, you know, I wanted to be this, I wanted to be a happier, more, more connected person. And I, I had to do a lot of work to do it. So I, I think it was all just the process of becoming unclenched as a human being freed me up to become a much more viable, interactive and, and uh, mutuality oriented musician 
by becoming one as a human being, by making those aspects of my humanity, I made them aspects of my musicality. I think that's a really good word is unclenched. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, because it's really, you know, the more and more kind of somatic awareness, you know, somatic therapy is coming out. And we're realizing that the way we hold our body and the language we use to relate to our body and our psychology is really, really meaningful. And it just sort of makes me, you know, I think about a clenched life versus kind of a life twirling to music. And just, you know, the, the, act, the activity of either playing, which requires very precise control over the body, or dancing, which, you know, is, is on some ways precise, on another level, is just very free and improvisational. Um, yeah. And I married a dancer. And she's oh, right into more of a dancer. My wife is a, loves to dance at my gigs and dance at gigs and stuff. So, and I was, I was that guy, you know, remember the Grateful Dead movie? One of the best things about the Grateful Dead movie was that it showed so many different ways to appreciate the dead. They showed that guy staring intently, right? And then they showed Alan out there in the, in the you know, outside the main room, just dancing wildly and everything... Right and all of the different ways you can concentrate on the Grateful Dead. And you can listen to it and have just as deep an experience out in the hall hearing it through a speaker as you can sitting at the rail at Jerry's feet, right? It's up to each individual. And I, I, I over the years, tried to become more of a dancer because I understood the value of that. But having spent so much time on stage with a guitar in my hands needing to be in control... Mm. I, I had to, you know, I, I, I still, I, I sort of like try to force myself to dance because I want to become more that kind of person. You know, that dance like nobody's watching thing, mm -hmm. there, that, that has great value because I had to learn to do that. It's like, just nobody gives a shit what you're doing. Get over there and throw yourself around a little bit. So it's been very yep. freeing to be married to a woman who does that you know, I'd like to, to, we, she's also a total introvert. And I am obviously, as you can tell, a textbook extrovert. And we have moved toward each other in that way too, over the years. We, that, one of the things about Scott, the Scott Peck book, the, um, uh, the Road Less Traveled was that it defined love as, you know, a commitment to, to the growth of one another, that you're, you know, and, and I, we've made that real. That's, that I really have become over the, over the course of this relationship, a partner, a full partner. And to mm -hmm. such that when something comes up now, the first thought is not to my own interest, but the first thought is to our interest. And in, in, around the house, the first impulse, over, over the years, if you do this right, you lose all those little stupid little bits of oppositionality that you experience. Like you and your newish wife are learning how to live in the same space together, right? right? So you keep bumping into each other and finding these little things. And over the years, you'll find that eventually your instinct will be to resolve them toward the mutuality rather than the in individuation. It's not that we're selfish. It's that we have different ideas of what's best for the mutuality. Well, that's, that's the process of becoming yeah. a unit is that over time, your needs and requirements will mesh better and right. you get better. I mean, ideally, I mean, I know there are marriages that pro proceed and progress in the other direction. They become less simpatico. But the satisfaction and the joy of finding this perfect partner and then putting the work into making that relationship work, it's paid off so massively in every area of my life. And I firmly believe that the fact that I live in this loving home with this woman who cherishes me as much as I cherish her empowers everything I do in this world. That knowing that I am loved this strongly by this amazing woman gives me so much strength in the world. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's not just me, it's us. And she's a, a absolutely integrated part of everything that I do. And all of that just feeds, you know, it, 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 say, it here's another way to look at it. And, and it touches on another thing that, that has been a huge thing in my life. When, when you, 
settle in with that partner over time, if you're smart, you eventually lose interest in any other potential partners. And the mind space you retrieve, oh, yes. you stop spending so much of your attention looking for sex partners. You get so much of your brain power returned to you. You know oh, yes. I, mean? I know exactly and, what you mean. And, and I'm, good, I'm good on that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's sort of, that's handled. Yeah, so, so that it, it immediately gives you so much more time in your life to, to concentrate on more important things. And so that motivates you to get better at your relationship and to put more energy into rubbing down the corners in those things. And I had a similar achievement five years ago when I busted my sugar addiction. Oh, wow. I weighed 250 pounds for most of my adult life, and now I weigh 178 pounds. Today, I weigh 178 pounds. And, and how I tall are that. you? I'm six foot, a little okay. under six foot. And I was a fat kid, and I was a fat grown-up, and I, I probably maxed out at about 275 pounds in the early 90s. And I read a book called Why We Get Fat that showed me how sugar works in the body. And, and then... In 2000, that was in 2012, and I started going into a low carb life. And then in 2015, I read an article in the New York Times about 12 about fasting, 12 hour fasting, and I adopted that, and that busted the sugar addiction. And I broke a 50 year cycle of carbohydrate addiction, and I realized that I had been organizing my life around food acquisition that I would go to like a party. I would connive to have a second slice of wedding cake, you know, at a reception, things like that. And again, once I busted that, I, I freed up so much mind space. I no longer obsess about acquiring food. And so it gives me so much more room for creativity and, and experiences and stuff. And, and I, I really feel like those two things, I unshackled myself from, uh, narcissism younger when i was younger by desperately seeking to get out of the cycle of unhappy and un, you know broken relationships and unhappy bands and then i resolved my lifelong addiction to sugar and i feel like i'm i'm happier and healthier at 66 right now and 178 pounds than i have been in my entire life and I, I worked my ass off to get here to do it. Mm -hmm. So what comes up for one? So there have been times, I think I've gone, I think I did 90 days without sugar once. And I think that I, I lived on the, I lived in a cold climate at the time. And I remember it being February and it was snowing out and it had been about 40 days without sugar. And I was curled up on the couch, miserable. And I was sure that if I just ate a chocolate croissant, the sun would come out. Did it? No, I didn't eat it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't cave, but I'm just kind of curious. And it's just a, a silly little thing. Uh, I'm just curious, like what comes up for you? What came up for you when you were struggling with that? Or did it just happen like that? I, again, I was very strongly motivated. I quit cocaine in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And it was the same, same kind of thing. I was tired of being a weakling. I was tired of wasting money. I was tired of getting up, you know, after insufficient sleep. I was tired of chewing my teeth at 3 a.m. and all this other shit. And one day I, I was working uh, in 1982, I think it was. I was uh, working as a proofreader at a magazine. And I went home for lunch one day and I cooked up a little little batch of free base. And then I sat there and did it until it was 10 o'clock at night. I never went back to work. And I realized I was fucking myself up and I destroyed my equipment and never did that again. And some years later, I finally quit cocaine altogether. I, I, the funny thing is I like, it took me a few years to, to really get over cocaine. You know, every once in a while, somebody would offer me a line and I'd have some, you know, and then it finally got to the point where the very thought of it just turns my stomach. And if somebody offered me some now, I'd say, what the fuck is the matter with you? Um, I did the sugar thing on the recommendation of reading this book. I just thought, okay, this is worth a shot. This is, I need to, again, I was sick of being a fat guy. I was sick of being a weakling. I was sick of being 
addicted to food. I was sick of eating spoonfuls of peanut butter at 11.30 at night, you know, and things like that. And, and, and not, and looking terrible and risking my life. And I needed, I had to choose between insulin, you know, the possibility of spending the rest of my life on insulin and strength. And I, I, so I- Oh, it was that bad. Well, I, 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 you, Every time I saw a doctor, it was like, you know, you're at risk of diabetes. You need to lose weight. You need to, you know, you, the advice was coming and I was not sticking to it very well. So this book gave me the strong motivation. And I said, all right, I'm fucking well going to try this. And I sat down and I, I did it. I, I stopped eating oatmeal for breakfast. I stopped eating bread. I would go shopping in the afternoon. My wife is a school teacher for most of, of our, the, she retired five years ago. So I'd go shopping, you know, in, in the afternoon for that evening's meal. And I'd come home with a loaf of bread and I eat like a third of it with butter when I got home, you know, and unpacked the groceries. And then I'd eat more of it at dinner. I was just eating huge amounts of carbohydrates. And so I stopped at cold turkey pretty much. And I got results really quickly. I started seeing a, a, a fairly rapidly a reduction in cravings and a reduction in my weight. And so that I spent three years doing that. And then the fasting thing, the 12 hour fast turned out to be the, the key because that broke the cycle of carbohydrates. And now if I eat something really sweet right now, it does exactly what cocaine used to do to me. It gives me a feeling of mild nausea takes effect and then starts to create an instant craving for more. The first thing sugar does in your system is set you up for more. Right. And so breaking that cycle was the key. So I no longer, I, I mean, I can eat sweet things and I do. I just don't take two of those mints coming out of the restaurant. I don't eat a basket of bread before the meal at dinner. I don't eat oatmeal for breakfast and then, and, and then, find myself craving food again at 10 in the morning. I eat bacon and eggs for breakfast and don't get with no toast and no potatoes. And I don't get hungry again until one o'clock in the afternoon. So it took a, a certain amount of discipline, which I never had when I was younger mm -hmm. to sort of bootstrap into greater discipline. And that's how I did it. I, I was strongly enough motivated to take the first step and sufficiently reinforced to take additional steps up to the point where I no longer require the reinforcement. And I can now eat, like instead of eating a big bowl of ice cream with a, with a little bit of fruit on it, now I eat a big bowl of fruit with a little bit of ice cream on it. So I'm Got able it. to enjoy sweet things in proportion because they don't own me. Exactly mm. the way cocaine used to own me. Once you started, you can't stop. Sugar, same deal. I now am able to enjoy sweet things. But I made rules for myself. I don't eat crap. Right. I've, I've learned everything a Mars bar has to teach me, and I never need to eat another one. It's <laughs> shit food. It's really, really bad food. Yeah. Made with poor ingredients. It does nothing to my spiritual life. All it does is go to my midsection. So I don't eat that shit anymore. I'll, I'll eat a piece of homemade pie. And I will completely avoid packaged sweets. Right. And, and by choosing novelty and um, wholesomeness, it allows me to discard and ignore 80% of the food that's out there in the world that doesn't qualify as decent food. And so I basically just bootstrapped myself into an integrated nature Right. where I can control myself, and I never could control myself before. You reminded me of something I think I heard Michael Pollan say, was you can eat cookies if you want, just you got to bake them yourself. Yes, that was one of his rules. You want to eat Twinkies? Learn how to make Twinkies. And the, the reason that worked was that if, if you had to make those things, it's so much work to make that crap. And that was his point, that if you had to, you know, the fact that you could walk down to a gas station, he also talked about how he calls gas stations corn depots. Right. Because the ethanol in the gasoline is made from corn, and most of the food, quote, food, unquote, that they sell in those gas stations is high fructose corn syrup driven. 
Right. Well, you were talking about the flow state as a musician being con yeah. in communication and serving the music and things like that. I certainly have some of that with food as well. Like if I'm cooking in the kitchen with fresh ingredients, like there's a real magic to that. Yeah. And, you know, but I mean, I'm not a baker. Um, I kind of told my th thought that maybe the pandemic would make me a baker. It didn't quite happen, but you know, I can imagine, you know, making your own cookies. Like, is there something kind of wonderful about that? There's a different energy and there is a, I had one teacher who would talk about foods being chi positive, chi negative, you know, chi free foods. And there's actually, you know, some love going in there that you can perhaps measure. Well, my wife does the cooking in our house, okay. but I think, I, I, I think she would talk about that, that same thing. She's, she's that way. She's a, a she, she's a, um, a gardener and a knitter and she's been playing the ukulele for a little over a year now, cool. but she's seriously a serious cook. And, and, and she taught me about food. She started taking me to farmer's markets and teaching me about food and the value of food. And one of my, lines about myself is that I eat really good food and we spend money on good food so we don't have to spend it on insulin. Right. But my wife is that kind of cook. She's a wonderful cook. She, she adjusted our cuisine to suit my changes in diet. She was very skeptical when I said, we're going low carb, I'm going to eat meat and not pasta. She, first of all, being Italian American, she said, no pasta. I beg your pardon. <laughs> but you know, she, she understood that it was necessary to my survival. So she started adjusting our home diet to suit my needs. And she's just, she's a lovely cook, wonderful cook. She'll go research stuff and dig up a really cool recipe. So we eat magnificently every day because my wife loves to cook. She loves great ingredients. She chooses great ingredients. And so I think she would probably tell you that there is that kind of flow state with her because she'll take a recipe, she'll modify it. I see her annotations, you know, with next time she pulls the recipe out, she writes, writes, you know, she wrote down what she did to it last time and stuff like that. So for right. my wife there, I think cooking is that same kind of deep creativity and she's deeply, deeply connected to it. She loves trees. She's a nature person. She was part of the group that started the first organic grocery collective in San Francisco in 1976, oh. the inner sunset community food store. So, mm -hmm. If you were having this conversation with my wife, you would probably be talking about her flow state when she's doing those things. We'll have to have her on another time. <laughs> uh, so I'm guessing you probably don't drink either. I don't, I, I don't not drink. Okay. I've just never been an alcohol person. I started playing in bars when I was a kid and I very quickly, because, I mean, I'm from a Jewish family, which are not big drinkers, I think. That's what my dad used to tell me when I would drink so much. It's, I'm not, we were not very Jewish. I never went to shul. I wasn't bar mitzvah or anything, but we're culturally Jewish. And although sure. my parents had alcohol in the house, they just weren't alcohol people. And I never got into alcohol again, because I got into psychedelics early. Hey, to get back to our subject matter. Right. Are you, have you thought of a story? You thought of a fun story? I, I, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I have one or not, but my, my point is that I, I, chose mind expanding drugs rather than mind contracting drugs very early i never cared for downers i did like stimulants for a, for a lot for the wrong reasons but i okay. never cared for downers and i never cared for painkillers and stuff that took you out of your head i like stuff that took you deeper into your head mm. so psychedelics were for me and i preferred pot over alcohol and i just never become a drinker which i has been great for my long-term health because i've spent 50 years playing in bars and right. not drinking in a bar is a really great survival technique. Right. <laughs> but you brought up drinking for a reason? Well, I was just, you, you were thinking, you were talking a lot about restricting, restrictions and discipline and things like that. And it just sort of popped into my head. Well, the reason all this stuff works for me is that it doesn't feel restrictive. Mm. And, and that's the thing that I'm evangelizing, and I have evangelized this, and I have several younger male friends who have been reporting their weight loss to me, and it's been really, really thrilling that I helped get them on that path just by raving at them the way I've been raving at you about what I do. And the reason it all works is that I don't feel any sense of deprivation, and I don't feel like I'm exerting self-control. I literally changed myself to become somebody who craves those foods less. 
And I, it's a fucking miracle to me because I was never, I was a terribly undisciplined kid. My room was legendarily messy. I was late on my deadlines when I was a, a, a music journalist for 10 years. My editors all, I had a reputation for being late and undisciplined and getting my stuff done. So to have become so late in life, somebody who can damn well control himself is a miracle because I don't have to, I don't feel deprived. I don't crave sugar. I don't walk past that bowl of mints at the restaurant and sigh. I don't care. I don't need that. I don't want that stuff anymore. So to have gained enough self-control that I don't have to feel I'm exerting any self-control is mind-blowing to me. Right. I'm hearing kind of this theme of conscious transformation. Yes. And, 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 and at the beginning of it, I mean, I, I would say this whole process began in 1990. That's when the, I, I had this relationship with this woman that just devastated me. And what happened was uh, uh, one of my friends who was counseling me in, in, in one of the shoulders I was crying on used the word unconscious in, in, in a conversation we had, and it opened up this whole thing to me where I suddenly realized that what was going on was her unconscious stuff, not mine. And that was one of the things that therapy showed me was that I was an, a character in her drama. And all the devastation I felt, part of it was my own doing, but a lot of it was the fact that I was a character, an, a, a, an iconic character in her drama, and I was just the latest episode in a series of her episodes. That freed me up to recognize that I was, it wasn't entirely my fault. So I began to take an inventory of what was my doing and what I could control. And yes, that's exactly what it has been was a strongly motivated person who was sick to death of being unhappy and went to work making himself a better person. Right. On. I love that the new project, maybe it's not new, but it's seeming like, you know, you, you have the sugar thing handled, you've got the cocaine thing handled and the narcissism handled. It seems like the new work in progress is the dancing. Maybe so. But I don't get that many opportunities to dance because I'm mostly on stage. Right. But when I'm with my wife, she will, well, if we're at an event or something, she will grab me by the hand and pull me out on the dance floor. And I, I no longer resist. Right. Very nice. It's not, it's that it's important to me. It's like, to me, the, the big obstacles have been overcome and I'm now, I'm 66 right. years old. You know, I don't need any, another major project here. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to take up roller skating for Christ's sake. Right. But I, I, I'm just, I, I've become a, a, a say yes to it person, and I, I respond positively to my wife's urgings uh, as often as I can because she's right. I should, and I like was, it when I do. Was there a place? Where is one of the last places you, you got to go dancing before everything shut down? So I know that we go dancing. It's like we go to a party or a wedding reception or something. Got it. I mean, we don't go to a club and go dancing. We might, well, let's see. We might have gone out to, uh, there's a really fun country band around here called Crying Time. Okay. That uh, some friends of mine are in. And last time I remember going out to a bar to hear a band, it was them at the Parkway Lounge, which has since closed down. And that was, you know, that my wife grabbed me by the hand and made me go out and dance with her. And stuff. It's, it, I wouldn't say that's a major project, but it's one of those things that I've uh, determined I should say yes to for the rest of my days. Sure. Right on. And then where is one of the last places you performed before everything got shut down? I played in a benefit in Ojai, California on March 5th and then drove back up and played at the Point San Pablo Club, Harbor Club on Friday, March 6th with Scott Guberman and Roger Seidman. And that was the last public gig that I played. Mm -hmm. um, things started getting canceled right after that. I had a trip to Colorado I was going to do later in um, March to play with Joe Marcinek and some great guys. Um, and that got canceled. And then my entire April I had like a huge month of April. I had a two week tour in Ohio and New York, uh, uh, the Skull and Roses Festival in Southern California and a bunch of other local stuff, all of which, and my entire musical life just kind of got rolled up like a carpet one gig at a time. Right. The future kind of got rolled up, put in a, in a closet. And now 
who the hell knows when we'll get to play public gigs again. Right. I mean, what are your thoughts for the future? Sorry? What are your thoughts for the future? I, I don't know what to make of it. I changed. I, I sat around for a while and thought, what the hell is going to happen? How are we going to do this? How am I going to keep my music going? And then I started doing the occasional live stream. And then I thought, okay, I think if I, I'm just going to play every day and, and, and play on my own page and see what happens and sign up to do other things whenever I can. And it turned out to be a, a really fun and, and hugely constructive approach because I'm actually playing more music now than I did during my normal touring days because I'd come home from tour and I would get into doing other stuff and I might go a week without playing my guitar if I don't have any gigs or something, right? <clears throat> so I'm actually playing every day, every single day. And I'm, I'm, I'm not writing new songs, but I'm evaluating and revisiting my entire performing career. And I've played like more than 225 different songs in the course of this daily stream. I started playing every day on April 4th. Mm. I just thought, I'm just going to play every day at the same time and people will show up. And I've developed, I've got a bunch of regulars that tune in every day. And it's really, really fun. And a bunch of other people come by every day. And I've raised, I made some, you know, some reasonable money from it. You just play for tips and ask people to contribute. Some people contribute regularly. Some people don't contribute at all. And I also recognize that everybody else who's doing live streams is also asking for money as well. Um, unemployment is at like an outrageous high I, it's just a crazy time yeah. and I, i'm i just because i have income from my radio things nothing that i do pays as well as it used to but i managed be, also my wife's a retired school teacher we have a decent you know a, a reasonably low mortgage on our house which we've been in since 1993 so we're sort of in a, in reasonably good shape to to survive financially um but I need to make a few bucks from playing music. So this is a way to keep myself viable and pull in a few dollars. And it's turned out to be amazingly good for my music because I've, I've been revisiting material from my entire career, like the Cat Stevens songs I used to play in coffee houses in San Jose in 1971. You know, before I got into the Grateful Dead, I was doing all this John Prine, David Crosby, you know, I was doing the usual California singer songwriter type thing. And I still have a huge amount of that music in my memory, I can still play Desperado, you know, from memory and Hotel California and all these songs that I played when I was younger. And it's been really, really fun playing a daily stream because I want to mix it up. I don't, I, I, I have a lot of songs that I play, you know, like every five days. I keep track of what I'm playing and so that I don't repeat material too often. And I always try and, and introduce new things into the mix as well, at least a couple times a week. So I've, I've been revisiting so my own songwriting, which goes back more than 50 years and all the songs that I've been playing and also doing a lot of improvisation because I use a looper. I, I developed a way to, to jam with myself using a loop, a loop so that I can play a line and then play along with it. And I can build up like six, seven layers of music or interlocking layers of music. So I have found <clears throat> a format that allows me to make reasonably full music alone in my studio and because i also because i have 35 years of radio experience i'm not freaked out at the idea of talking to an invisible audience right so i'm i think i'm a little bit better suited to this form of performance because i already have experience of sitting in a room imagining who i'm playing for right, right. i was a little concerned you were gonna be able to hold up your end of the conversation today uh you're joking of course. yes yeah. <laughs> but I, I did also have to become a better listener over time. <laughs> being, being an interviewer, you know, you have to become a good listener too, as well as a. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I feel like, um, 
Yeah, listening to you on the air is, is is very inspirational. And now, you know, this new chapter of my life as a married guy, it's it's a whole new level of it's a whole new thing. It's a whole new dimension. It's I, I'm yeah. It, it, it's I think it's worth doing. I grew up in a in a sort of emotionally weird family. I I did when my brother's marriage broke up about twenty five years ago. I went to some therapy sessions with him because he wanted some corroboration for what he was telling his shrink. It was okay. fascinating, man, fascinating. Because I went to a couple sessions with him and then went back for the debrief. And what the therapist said was he rarely seen a family so completely mutually isolated from one another. He said, usually families are organized into systems, you know, parents versus kids or, you know, like the abusive father versus everybody and all that kind of stuff. But he said in our family, every single person had the same report of feeling isolated from everybody else, that everybody else was in on the, on the secret and we were being excluded. Interesting. And that's how I felt my entire life. And it, it was, uh, astonished me that, that, my brother reported the same thing. Right. And it turned out our sister felt the same way too, that every one of us had felt isolated from the others and that, that, that we had experienced a lifetime of low grade emotional abuse from parents that were competing with their kids instead of nurturing their kids. Right. So this was the emotional matrix I had to overcome. And I had, I can, sorry? I can see that that would make it difficult to be play in a band. Yeah. If you don't, I, I, I just also, because it was one of those, those, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of a textbook Jewish emotional matrix, the sort of, um, you're such a genius. Why are you such a fuck up kind of thing? The mixed message, the, the, the compliment that's followed with a smack of some kind, you know, the, the undermining thing that happens a lot. Sure. And I, the backhanded I, compliments. Yeah, and, 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 and I had to learn to take a compliment, and I had to learn to give a compliment. I had to learn to, to, to be generous with people, that I didn't need to protect myself so much. Once I stopped feeling I had to protect myself against everything, once I allowed myself to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. and that's the thing I had to learn, and that's the thing that's still an aspect of the work in my marriage with my wife, because we she came from a different kind of emotional matrix. She was a peacemaker between her, her parents that who were having conflicts and stuff. So we both brought this sort of childhood emotional stuff into our relationship, and were compatible enough that we could support each other and and teach each other, you know, and and improve each other and sort of patch up the cracks in each other's psyches uh, and and that again that becomes the mission you, when you're committed to the marriage you're committed to your partner's spiritual growth and so that means you stop competing and start supporting and you you find out that personal sacrifice isn't that bad a thing it's you know you're it, because helping her is helping you that what i do to 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 support my wife is supporting me too. Everything that happens now, we are two halves of the same person. And when you can really make that work and you can really do it successfully, mm -hmm. it's so profoundly rewarding. I, 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 I'm overwhelmed routinely by how incredibly joyous my marriage is because we did all this work to make it happen. And I just, there, there, I, I trust her so completely. There is no moment of concern that she doesn't have my interest at heart, that we aren't a, a, a mutual unit. And that I never is. thought I would have that. I never thought I would have that because I grew up in this family, right. of, you know, sardonic, um, ungenerous, not ungenerous. We, it's not that we weren't kind to each other, but there was just, there was just a lot of competition and a lot of sort of undermining rather than support. You know, that I, when I see images of huge sibling solidarity, when I see stories that depict uh, paternal love, I, I get emotional because these are the things that were lacking in my own life. Right. And I see those things and, I, you know, I, I get a little, a little sad for what I missed in that. But on the other hand, Look where I am. Every if I had, if you had if I had asked my twenty two year old self, you know, where would you like to be when you're sixty six? 
if I had said, well, living in a really, really nice house with my favorite human being in history and making my living doing music related things, I would have said, yeah, all right, that's a result I can live with. And here I am with that life. So, I mean, it okay. sounds like you, you, the 20 year old, you maybe couldn't have even come up with that. No, the 20 year old me was way too deep in his own muck to have any right. sense of, I mean, I didn't even, I, I never planned any of this stuff. That's another thing. I, I stumbled into this entire life, man. And I lived an improvised life. And part of that is because the Grateful Dead showed me you could. Right. The Grateful Dead. Um, I, I, once I figured out what was going on in that world, I, I, I just fell into things. My, my dad got me my first job doing graphic design and editorial stuff in the, his union newspaper. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so I did photography and learned how to do paste up and all that kind of stuff. But that's the only job I've ever had. Every other job I had after that was related to music. I played guitar and sold pot for a couple of years. And then I started writing for music magazines and went to work at BAM in 76. And I worked at Bass Tickets in 76 for a while. So every single thing I've done for a living since 1976 has been oriented toward music and doing music related things. And so I didn't, uh, my first book deal came by accident. The radio thing came by accident. I went to, I appeared on the KFOG Deadhead Hour to promote playing in the band, the book. Mm -hmm. And it turned out the guy that was hosting the show could use some help because he wasn't really a deadhead. Plus, he had a huge full-time job being the morning drive DJ and stuff. So I and a couple of other guys started providing him with material. And the station manager noticed, recognized that I had written a book about it. And they eventually asked me to take over responsibility for the show. So becoming the host and producer of the Grateful Dead Hour was not something I planned to do. I, I, something cool appeared in front of me and I started participating in it and then it, it became my responsibility and then other stations started calling me to, could they carry the Grateful Dead Hour too which I didn't I didn't plan to roll out a syndicated show I was just doing the Fog Deadhead Hour and it became syndicated because I was smart enough to recognize a door when it was kicked open in front of me so my entire life has been falling recognizing a good opportunity when it came uh, but not really working. I, like I didn't envision something and set a goal and set out to do it. I just improvised my way through interesting opportunities and wound up mm -hmm. with this ridiculously happy, satisfied life. No, I get it. I mean, that's what I'm doing. That's how this podcast started to exist as well. Like I didn't think up the podcast. You know, Follow your just, bliss. I was just following my bliss. I didn't even set out to do psychedelic centered coaching. Huh. You know, I just knew that I didn't want to teach hard, fast yoga with loud music anymore. And I, <laughs> that what you no, were doing? Seriously, seriously. Well, I mean, you know, it's like I was, you know, I was doing a lot of, you know, I stretched my mind kind of far with LSD and I needed to integrate and heal and put myself back together a little bit. And so I just did a lot of yoga because that's what Ram Dass said to do. Someone gave me be here now. So I was like, okay, I'll just do this. And yoga kind of yoga teaching turned into med practicing yoga turned into teaching yoga and owning a yoga studio turned into teaching meditation turned into coaching turned into psychedelic integration coaching turned into this conversation. So every step made sense in its own context and yeah. you didn't have to spend a lot of energy making a long term plan. I, I think people like us generally wind up happier than people who set up a structure in advance and then struggle to fit into it. You know, I knew a guy when I was in college who was like, was so heavily tracked. His family was like wealthy Beverly Hills, you know, industrialists or whatever. And he was so tracked into his MBA course and stuff. And this guy was just so driven. And when he got out of college, he didn't know who the hell he was. And I don't, I, I, I lost track of him after a while, but it just, he didn't seem like a guy who, he seemed like he was constantly competing with himself and with his family's expectations and stuff. And I just kind of felt like, I'm glad my parents were too lazy to force me to do anything. Cause I got, I wound up improvising a much happier life than I would have gotten if I, if I try to get into medical school or some other bullshit, you know? Well, I think like, the almost like the grace you you were on the no simple road podcast and you talked about the you know the grateful dead dna yeah. and i you know i have the spiritual bent so i almost think about it more like a grace or a karma 
you know, as a Grateful Dead, you know, you're, you're, you're touched by a certain grace that enables you to listen to the words and to extract sort of codes of like values. You know, it's like, like sort of our values and our hearts are sort of shaped by whatever is going on, you know. And, yet, and, and then yet. that guides the life. And the externals are arbitrary. But it's not like we're, you're running your life based on Grateful Dead lyrics. No, no, no. Something that's sort of extrapolated, something underneath them. I think the way they do things, just the... the, the democratic nature of things on stage, even though there was a first among equals thing with Jerry, for example, and also the, the, the way they kept us in the loop more than most uh, modern industries do and stuff like that. I think the Grateful Dead modeled that human gestalt just passively, just by existing, they showed us, and a lot of people showed how things can be done differently. And those of us, I, and that, that, the thing about the DNA, that was Jay Blakesburg's line. I, I interviewed Jay, I wrote an essay for Jay's uh, book of Jerry's, Jerry Foot. I wrote the main essay for uh, Jay's Jerry book. And I went over to his house and we had this wonderful conversation uh, that I wanted, you know, to, to provide him material for the essay. And that's what he said, you know, we were lucky to be born with that Grateful Dead strand of DNA instead of the heavy metal strand of DNA. You know, the, the people, like Jerry said, you know, it's like licorice. If you like licorice, you really like licorice. And if you don't, you don't. And those of us who get the Grateful Dead, yeah, it, it, we like that sort of ramshackle thing of doing it different every time rather than trying to instantiate the perfect version of the song. The Eagles are the opposite. The Eagles did this thing of playing exactly, exactly like their record. And in fact, they brought the same equipment they used in the studio. When you went to an Eagles concert, you heard that guitar solo on um, Hotel California played through the same amplifier on the same guitar through the same pedals that were used in the studio. And they replicated their albums perfectly and did it so well that you thought they were making it up on the spot. They were so good at pretending it was live. Mm -hmm. And they're so the opposite of what the Grateful Dead were showing us. Right. And, and so as a musician, you, you can do it the one way or you can do it the other way. And I've never, because of the Grateful Dead, I've just never gotten interested in perfection yes. as, as, a, uh, as a value. This music isn't about perfection. It's about now. It's about the real time experience of playing music for people in the moment. And it's about how you feel right now and how the guys you're playing with feel right now. Body said it to me in an interview years ago. You know, it's like, well, you know, it depends on what everybody had for lunch that day and if they're fighting with their old lady that day. And all of these factors go into it. When I'm playing my songs, I'm thinking about all kinds of things. And I'm, when I'm doing improvising, this comes up in, in there's a Grateful Dead musicians discussion page on Facebook. And, and sometimes people get into these sort of philosophical things about playing music. And I always have a hard time trying to articulate it because I don't really think about what I'm doing. I don't think what mode I'm in when I'm playing. Um, I, I, it's not that I don't think about music when I'm playing, but I'm, I'm thinking about abstract things. When I'm playing a solo, I feel like I'm talking. Even though I'm not using words, I feel I'm, I'm expressing an emotion. Well, that's and what I would love about Jerry, is that he would tell you in words and then he would tell you again in the solo. Yes. Yeah. And that, and, and that the immediate real-time be here now aspect of music making is much more important to me than the getting it just exactly perfect thing. Mm -hmm. And that... And, and, and that turned out to feed into a, an improvised life as well. And I, I, it's not that I don't pay attention to things like getting the mortgage paid and making sure my bank balance is adequate and all that kind of, you know what I mean? It's not like I'm freed from the practicalities of life, but it's sort of like being, you know, you, when you become a bodhisattva, when you can deal with whatever's coming your way, you know, it, it's, there's a peace that you can get once you feel like you're, you're, you can handle anything. Well, I love the concept of perfection as a value, you know, that you can either prioritize or not, especially in a world, you know, there's this increasingly 
kind of capitalistic, late stage capitalistic, homogeneous sort of um, McDonald's, McDonald'sification, you know, but Starbucksification of America, where it's like, oh, this is, you know, Starbucks has decided what is the perfect cup of coffee that's going to make the millions of dollars. Not necessarily the perfect cup of coffee that's going to delight one's soul, which is probably going to be different for the guy who's staring at Jerry's feet like this and the guy who's twirling out in the back. Like their cup of coffee is probably going to be different. Yes. And if you, you know, but if you're just sort of figuring out, like, how do I make something homogeneous and clean enough so that we can just keep the trains running on time, you know, it's, it's a different world than maybe some of us want to live in. Yeah. Well, I named my record label Perfectible Recordings. Hmm. And I'll tell you why. And when my, my, my first record I made with my dear friend, Eric Rollins, who's not a professional musician, but we made this record because we wanted, we both wanted the experience of making a studio record. And I was hoping to start making records, you know, regularly. And in the studio, we hired a producer and an engineer. We worked in the studio. And at the end of a take, we would listen back to it and decide if it was the one we could keep and work on and improve or if we needed to do another take. And our shorthand term for, yeah, this is the take we'll work on is it's perfectible. It. You can, it can be cleaned up. We can correct this bad note. We can move this note around. So perfectible became sort of the code word for um, uh, the project, right? This, this the take is perfectible. And then when, we, when it came time to make the CD, I said, well, let's call our label perfectible recordings. What the and that became my business. And I, I uh, recently started my online store and named it perfectible.net. But in my sort of philosophical statement on the front page, I explained that perfection is attainable. And I have delivered what I would consider perfect performances of like, you know, technically flawless and spiritually rich performances that I would consider like perfect performances. But perfection isn't the... Uh, demand. Perfection isn't the ideal. Perfection is attainable, but it's not necessary. You know what I mean? You, you can have what, perfect experiences, but that's not, but anything less than perfect is also still okay. Well, and then, you know, it, it's also a question of what, what are our metrics? Yes. Yeah. And you know, I, if, think, I believe in sort of the perfectibility of mankind. We can strive to be better but it doesn't mean that we're bad people if we aren't perfect. You know what I mean? Perfection is a nice goal, but it's not the 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 uh, core value. Well, you're reminding me of a a night on LSD. We had we we came up with a chant that we would repeat to each other for hours and laugh our heads off about it. I'm sure you know the kind of thing. And yeah. it was that we were perfect and getting better. <laughs> That's good. And that, you know, enabled us to stay in like a place where our hearts were really open. We were like super, you know, we we're just really accepting ourselves, you know, we we're just really allowing things to be perfect as they were, you know, with also the knowledge that we were kind of young, growing people. Well, it also addresses the mutability of the word perfect, because mm -hmm. I, we are living in a perfect moment. This moment is perfectly itself. It's yes. not the perfect life. And God knows it's not the perfect government. But it, you know, it, it's that it, it's it is what it is, and it is itself, and it's perfect in itself, and that doesn't mean you should sit on it and stick with it, because it's perfectly itself, but that doesn't mean it can't get better. So I love that phrase, "perfect but getting better." Yeah, it does. It doesn't abdicate, take take away our personal responsibility. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, I heard that you have your guitar like right at your hand. I do. Is there a reason that this was there? Well, <laughs> I could play. What should I play? You were you mentioned a song before we were talking. Before we went live, you mentioned a song. The song I wrote for my wife. That could have been it. I could go for a, a, a love song that was worth ten years to hear. All right. This is this is a song I wrote ten years too late for my wife's wedding. I mean, for my for our wedding. Broke for my wife ten years too late for our wedding. That 
that's real love so hard to define it don't you dare decline it when it comes for you you'll recognize it you'll come to prize it that's real love That's real love. It's such a treasure to take such pleasure in your regard. We've done the hard part. Let's lead with our hearts. That's real love. Decidedly imperfect performance. That's real love. There's nothing sweeter than life with Rita, my real love. It's everlasting. It's flabbergasting. That's real love. My favorite moments as a songwriter was the odd response from a fellow songwriter that I used the word flabbergasting in a song. <laughs> it stuck out for me as well. <laughs> and you did, you managed to rhyme it, didn't you? Yes. What did you rhyme it with? It escaped me. It's everlasting. It's flabbergasting. Right. Very, very yeah. nice. Yeah. She said well, thank you. Important. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for digging so deep with us today. Oh, I enjoyed this a lot. This is oh, a, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to have this kind of conversation. That's one of the great things about the internet. It enables, like, you know, Starbucks would never put a conversation like this up. It's not nearly homogenized enough. Right. So we get to have, you know, incredibly narrow focused conversations of interest to small but significant numbers of people. Right. Because of channels like this. And that gets us back to thanking Brian for putting us on Deadhead Land. We can talk to all these nice people. Indeed. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering if what I'm what I'm hoping now is I have sort of a, an intention after the fact, you know, I'm hoping that some of our conversation maybe even inspires this new love song that you're writing for Rita. It might. I, I, it, my songwriting process is is not very deliberate. I, I sort of let stuff cook for a long time. Again, I mentioned earlier, I'm not one of those guys that writes 30 songs and keeps two of them. Right. I really nurture them for a long time inside my head and, until there's enough of a kernel of, of uniqueness to, to put it out and start putting it on paper and stuff. So I think for long times and I write little short phrases on scraps of paper and keep them in a file. And then when I have enough ideas around that, I, uh, around the concept, then I'll sort of try and string it together into a song. So there's both mystical, inspirational crap and serious technique uh, and, you know, mechanics in the process. And I don't question it too much. Uh, you know, I've, I've been, I've got plenty of great songs that I'm very, very pleased with, and I'm not in any rush to crank another one out. So when it's ready, it'll emerge. Right. Right. 50, 50 years of songwriting, you said. That's right. Well, so you can find. Right. I have a lot of music for sale at perfectible.net. I've put out more than a uh, eleven, ten or twelve albums, I think, with a lot of original material. There's a couple of song albums that are mostly Grateful Dead stuff, including one called uh, "It's a Hand Me Down" that's all Grateful Dead songs in my solo electric style. 
Mm -hmm. But a lot of original music, a lot of great players. I, I've got Mark Perrin on a bunch of my records, and Robin Sylvester's been a great partner. So uh, I've, I've been so freaking cool, cool, man. Robin, I love Robin. Just it's so it. great. Yeah. Having, the Bay Area is just an amazing place. With so many wonderful musicians. Mm -hmm. So tell us, so, so there's albums that people can get on Perfectible. Yeah. Uh, how else can folks support you or, you know, stay in touch or well, of I that have, nature? I play uh, every day on Facebook. Uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock California time, I'm playing here on the Dead Headland channel. Mm -hmm. And then every other day of the week, I play at 4 o'clock. Uh, uh, at the D Gans music channel on Facebook. And I'm also available. I've done a few private house concerts on zoom, which was surprisingly fun to do cool. because when I'm doing my live streams from home, I, I don't look at the topic. I don't interact with people while I'm playing. It would be really boring to watch a guy looking off screen typing between songs. Right. So I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I read after I play, I go back and read all the comments and listen back to the set so I can interact with people that way and collect requests for the next day. Right. So I'm playing every day on Facebook and also available to do these private concerts. I have music and books for sale at perfectible.net. And I also have a bunch of pages on Facebook. The Grateful Dead Hour has a page. Sales, Tales from the Golden Road has a page. The uh, Drop the Bone album has a page. Uh, this is All the Dream We Dreamed has, uh, has a page. So I'm, I'm hugely easy to find. I'm on Twitter as David Gans. Uh, so I'm very easy to find and very easy to reach. I answer my own emails and stuff like that. So I have no infrastructure. I'm a one-man operation. So I'm very easy to find and to I'll get in touch with. Right, as evidenced by the fact that this was even possible. Well, I appreciated you reaching out. I love having these kind of conversations. And I, I like the, I, I, you know, you can, if you look at, um, on the nostalgia channels, you can see old episodes of the Dick Cavett show. Mm -hmm. Like from the late 60s and early 70s, it's amazing how deep the conversations were on an 11.30 p.m. TV show. I mean, it's, you can't imagine. Colbert is doing some pretty deep stuff right now during his lockdown shows. He has really nice interviews that go fairly deep. But it's rare in mainstream media to have conversations of this kind of granularity, you know. So it's nice yeah. that we're able to do it and reach an audience that's big enough to sustain it you know we're not just talking into the void right so well, I uh, the opportunity yeah man um really appreciate it it's, it's been fantastic uh and you know i hope to stay connected um and yeah would would really yeah again i, I I'm mumbling now, I'm mumbling over my words. I'm just grateful you showed up. I'm grateful for everybody who who are watching. I appreciate um, the invitation. And if you ever if you ever circle back and have people on a second time, we could do that somewhere down the line as well, if you like. Yeah, man, absolutely. I would I would I would absolutely love that. That would be fantastic. You know, I basically failed our general. Our, the central mission was to deliver a story of a psychedelic epiphany, and I didn't give you a single one. Well, I mean, just go into your freezer and just eat whatever's back there, and I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Daniel. This has been great. All right. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, if you want to support the show, either um, patreon.com slash deadheadland or patreon slash Um uh, And also, you know, buy some David Gans books. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. If you order a book from me, it gets signed by both authors because Blair lives a block away. Oh, my God. Autographed books. You, you can't beat it. If you order a book from me, it gets signed by both authors. Thank you again. Right. All right. Thank you. Be well. Bye. Be well. Bye.